we turn our attention to the reading and preaching of God's Word, let's pray. Ask the Lord to help us. Oh Lord, that is the prayer that we bring. We ask that you would help us as your Word is read and preached, that the Spirit would be working amongst us through this our eyes and ears, we might see and hear the truth of the gospel, that we might rejoice in the resurrection, ascension, and reigning of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, that the Spirit might magnify Him before us, that you would guard the words of your servant, that He would lessen, and that Christ would be lifted up. For it's in His name that we do pray. Amen. Well, if you'll turn your Bibles or uh, tap on your, your devices there and get to Luke chapter 24, we're going to be looking at Luke 24, verses 36 to 53 together uh, this uh, morning. In the previous uh, chapters, uh, reading up to this and, and the other places in the Gospels you can go to and you read what, what brings us to this, the Bible tells us, recounts, records these things and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of what happened so the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in his earthly ministry, that earthly ministry uh, begins to come to an end as he's uh, lived perfectly, kept his own law. He has sinned not, and yet one of the twelve uh, in which he chose betrays him, and uh, those who are in authority uh, arrest him. He is sent to the cross to be crucified. He, he goes willingly as the perfect Lamb of God, uh, that he might atone for the sins of his people in, in his death, that he might uh, redeem them and pay the penalty of our sins. And he dies as we read, and he's buried, and then on the third day he rises from the dead. And then the section that we come to here that we'll be reading after his resurrection, he appears to his disciples and meets with them. Let's read. Listen. Follow along as I read Luke 24, verses 36 to 53. This is God's inerrant and perfect word. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and we're continually in the temple, blessing God. You know, as we look at the, the bigger picture here, as I mentioned, if we go back a few chapters and we look at uh, the ministry of Christ leading into uh, his death and resurrection, and then uh, now his coming to uh, the disciples, I think maybe a way we could... We could picture this, not perfectly, but we could see it as, as a captain of a ship who has a crew. And this captain is on the ocean with his crew. The boat is out, and he's, and he's doing wonderful things. He's, he's taking care of 
uh, this crew. The crew is believing in him. They, they're beginning to think, I mean, the way that, that our captain leads us, uh, it seems like he finds every wind that is needed to keep our sails full. I mean, he's, he's doing everything to keep us safe. It's pretty amazing. And, and he keeps telling them, there is a storm coming. We're going towards the storm, okay? It's going to get pretty wild and crazy, but I'm here and I'm going to take care of you. Okay, yes, yes, captain, we hear you. And, and they're going and they're going. And then the day comes that the storm hits the ship. And it is a huge storm, such that the crew is holding on to ropes. They're, they're afraid they're going to be washed away. They look up and they see the captain holding the wheel and everything is fine. But then there's a moment where they don't see the captain and they begin to, to scream and freak out and yell at one another. The captain is gone. We're all going to die. And they go down into the belly of the ship and they're huddled up and they're hearing the water hitting the side of the boat and crying pressing in upon it and they're fearful that in any moment the ship is going to break and they're going to die and they're weeping and crying to one another how could we be abandoned and left and in the midst of that their captain walks in and he's calm and he says peace peace get back get back to your places we're going to ride through the storm just like i told you and the voyage is going to continue and in many ways that's the the setting here the 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 disciples, having heard of and know that Christ has died, they are in great fear. They are upset. They are some ashamed of, of the way they've acted in the last few days. They're fearful. They don't understand. They're confused. Though the Lord told them, though Christ told them what was coming, what was happening, they're, they're, they're confused in the midst of this and Christ appears and his presence immediately changes everything for them immediately changes the direction of their life it immediately changes the direction of the world all these things are pointed in the fullness of time to come but it is that great moment and as we look at these few verses together this morning as, as we look at the end of, of the gospel according to Luke what I want us to see is that Jesus Christ's resurrection brings peace calling his church to worship and mission. Jesus Christ's resurrection brings peace, calling his church to worship and mission. And we're going to look at three things together. The risen Christ appeared to his disciples to give them peace. The risen Christ appeared to his disciples to give them a mission. The risen Christ appeared to his disciples to bless and be worshipped by them. So the first thing we're going to look at, this risen Christ, the, the risen Christ appearing to his disciples uh, to give them peace. Jesus' disciples were together, and they were talking of the news of what they'd heard that, that Jesus had risen. They'd heard these things, and, and I imagine surely they were discussing, is it true? And then they were probably were talking about the things that were said. Not that the, the captain of the ship said, we're going to the storm and we will sail through it, but he said, I'm going to die to redeem my people. And then he appears. I mean, think about that day. That morning, the disciples wake up and, and the amount of emotions that must have been going on in them. As I mentioned earlier, there's fear. If they kill Jesus, what are they going to do to us? I mean, we've been with Jesus. They all know who we are. If they took him out, are they coming for us next? And then there was the shame, particularly you think that Peter must have felt. Jesus told him, you're going to deny me. Peter said, no, 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 I'll never deny you. I'll die before I deny you. And, and what is it the scriptures recount? Peter denied Christ, denied ever knowing him because he was afraid of the implications that might come if it was found out that he was one of the disciples. And then they hear accounts that, that Christ is risen. They've been told Jesus is alive. And then I'm sure there were probably emotions, their guts were turning. What a horrible trick, you would say, to come and tell us that, 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 that Christ, that Jesus, the one that we love so dearly, is alive. And then surely there was hope too, though. Perhaps everything that he told us, perhaps the things we've been learning about since ch our childhood from the scriptures is true. And then in the midst of that, when they're in such turmoil, that's when Jesus appears. He appears amongst them. And Jesus, knowing that his disciples are frightened and troubled and, and, and doubted, he even says, I'm not a spirit. It's me. I'm here. Risen. Flesh. 
and blood. And, and Jesus shows great love and patience to his disciples as he explains them this peace that he brings. What he's done, what he's accomplished, what was happening these last few days. And he's being very gracious, very kind, very patient, and that's how he treats us. But we need to remember also that, that Christ, when we look through the scriptures, we look at it, that, that Christ is not uh, a, a pushover. He's not some uh, effeminate wuss. I mean, Christ is, is the, the God-man. Christ is the one who cleansed the temple in righteous anger. He made a whip and drove the money changers out. He drove them out of the court of the Gentiles that he might clear the way that the Gentiles could come to worship he did these things. He was not afraid to stand up and rebuke the religious leaders, these self-righteous leaders, who in many ways it did show that uh, humanly speaking it seemed that they had the life of those in, in Jerusalem in their hands. He stood up against them. And then we read in Revelation 19 that Jesus will lead, armies of, lead the armies of heaven. And as we read, treading the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. So, so it's not that Jesus came in and knew nothing what to do but to be kind of, uh, oh, I'm so, oh, everyone's upset, I'm sorry. But, but it was because he came in and actually was one that could bring real peace. He could speak. He's not a cruel tyrant. He is a loving Savior and King who cares for his people. He is the good shepherd who leaves the flock to get the one that wanders. He is the good shepherd that, as we, we read in Psalm 51, who will, who will break the leg of the sheep who continues to wander into danger. He is the one who feeds us and cares for us, protects us, defends us. And Jesus is perfectly fulfilling this messianic prophecy that describes who he is and how he acts and what the, the characteristics of his saviorhood is. We read in Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42, there's just a few verses here. It goes through the whole chapter, but we're just going to read the first four verses because we see this on display, this prophetic word about who the Messiah would be. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. And it goes on and on from there, but we see that, that reality that we've already looked at about the fact that, that Jesus is gentle, and what that means is, is great power under control. Even as we uh, are praying for uh, this dear child in, in, in the NICU right now, we, we, we envision his father taking him, a grown man with strength, and holding this little itty-bitty infant. And if he wasn't careful, he could squeeze the baby too much in his strength as a grown man. But he doesn't. He controls his power. He's gentle in the same way that Christ is, is gentle with his people. He shows great love and patience to us, particularly in our spiritual weakness. In, when we read in, in the gospel accounts, when, when folks come to Christ and say, my faith is weak, strengthen my faith, he doesn't laugh at them, he doesn't mock them, he doesn't tell them to get out of his way. But instead, he... He strengthens them and encourages them. He does the same to us. When we go to the Lord and we cry out in prayer, and we say, my, my, my faith is weak, we don't expect for the Lord to strike us down, but to strengthen us. He cares for the disheartened, the discouraged, the, the fearful, those who are facing great challenges, the brokenhearted, those who are doubting. Those are the ones that the Lord comes, that Christ comes and as the faithful Savior, is gracious, patient, long-suffering, and kind to us as he cares for us. Like we read here in, in Isaiah, he will not break the bruised reed. He will not quench the 
a faint wick. These disciples who we can only imagine were at that moment of breaking, and yet he comes in and does not crush them. He doesn't look around and say, it's kind of ridiculous. I told y'all what was coming. I mean, I gave you my word. Your great-great-grandfathers were reading it. What, what happened, guys? What were you doing? They said he comes in and proclaims peace to them and ministers to them. It does not crush them. And this message of peace that he brings to his disciples, it's more than a greeting. You know, we can think of he comes in and he's like, peace. You know, he, he throws that message out. But it's more than just, hello, how are y'all doing? But he's speaking to them, ultimate peace. Peace has been accomplished between God and sinners. I have done this. I have redeemed my people. There is peace for you in me. For all those who trust in me for salvation, the work that I just did on the cross, there is great peace for you now in forgiveness and salvation. And all who ask God to forgive their sins and trust in Christ for salvation receive that peace that Christ speaks of here to his disciples. We see... Secondly, the risen Christ appeared to his disciples to give them a mission. Jesus teaches his disciples everything that the Old Testament had proclaimed, had stated, and had said was coming to pass. I don't know if y'all have seen these descriptions of master classes where you can, you can go learn about something from someone who's you know, an expert at it, you know, whatever it may be. Maybe you want to you know, learn how to fish. So you go find this master class from a professional fisherman that tells you uh, how to find that actual fish. And so you go from fishing to, to catching, you know, what it may be. Or perhaps, perhaps when you write, you, you, you just, your brain melts and you're like, I don't understand grammar. So you go and you look for someone who, who grasps English grammar perfectly and they are able to give you this master class and you can learn and, and grow in these things. What we see here, what's recounted, is that in that moment when Christ appears, the master is giving a master's class on theology. He says that he explains to the disciples what it was that the Old Testament had proclaimed about him. All the prophecies, all the preparations, all the types, all the things that were pointing to the coming Savior and what he was going to do. And he's explaining these things to them because he wants them to understand what has happened. Remember, they were just in a moment of great turmoil right before his appearance. And they were, they were, they were turned upside down in understanding. And, and Christ comes and he's to his disciples. What happened was supposed to happen. It was appointed to happen. Everything happened exactly as I wanted it to happen. And this is why and this is what I did. And he explains these things to them. And then he gives them this mission. And they need to understand these things if they're going to then, as the disciples and as the church, follow and pursue this mission that Christ gives to his church. They need to understand what has happened. They need to know these things, what the scriptures say about Christ, who he is, what he's done, what he's doing now, and the reality that he is returning. You know, it's one of the things as we read the scriptures it's one of the prayers that should be a regular prayer for us. Lord, as I prepare to read this passage, these couple of verses, this chapter, this book today, God, as I come, may the Spirit teach me, open my eyes to the truth, that I wouldn't just be moving through words on a page, but that I would read your word and understand and have wisdom and grow in connection with you through that. That's our prayer that, that we might enjoy that. Even as the disciples were hearing Jesus speak, when we read God's word, it is hearing God speak to us. And Jesus gives his disciples a, a mission, a command coming out of this. Jesus commands the disciples uh, first to stay in Jerusalem. He said, stay in Jerusalem because there's more promised things to come. And we looked at that when we moved through Acts. Acts chapter 2 shows that. The, he gives them that command to stay because the 
comforter hasn't come yet. The Holy Spirit hasn't been poured out on the church. And when the Holy Spirit comes in Pentecost, that is when they are to go out into all the world and to proclaim the gospel. That is when they are to go and do this mission, which is to make disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel, to teach and proclaim everything in the scriptures, who Jesus is, that there is salvation and forgiveness in Christ, and to take that all over the world and make disciples. That's the mission, make disciples of Jesus Christ, preach the gospel, baptize, equip these disciples with the scriptures, and then just repeat and repeat and repeat until he returns. And we pray that God will help us to do that in faithfulness. We see a clear picture of that when we we turn to Matthew chapter uh, 28, and and we read beginning in, in verse 16 for a few verses here. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We talked about this last week when we were together. As we've been moving through the Sermon on the Mount, we're looking at the Beatitudes, we came to the conclusion where where Christ proclaims the identity of Christians as you are salt and light. That's how the Lord is working, making disciples who go out as salt and light. And he uses just regular folks like you regular folks like me, as salt and light to transform the world as the church follows the mission to make disciples do these things. And by God's grace, we pray that, that the church, particularly we pray it for here at Christ Church, that we will stay on the mission that Christ has given us, be faithful to it, empowered by the Spirit, and that would be what we are about as we keep our purpose to glorify God and worship Him. Then we come to our third, our third point that we're looking at. The risen Christ appeared to his disciples to bless them and to be worshipped by them. It's one of the interesting things. Jesus' disciples worship him with great joy. No longer, as we get to the end of Luke, and they worship him, it just says with great joy. No more of the turmoil. They weren't uh, in the belly of the ship, as it were stressed, fearful. Now it's all joy. As J.C. Rowell has written, how shall we account for these joyful feelings? How shall we explain the singular fact that this little company of weak disciples left for the first time like orphans in the midst of an angry world was not cast down, but was full of joy? The answer to these questions is short and simple. The disciples rejoiced because now for the first time they saw all things clearly about their master. The veil was removed from their eyes. The darkness had at length passed away. The meaning of Christ's humiliation and low estate. The meaning of his mysterious agony and cross and passion. The meaning of his being Messiah and yet a sufferer. The meaning of his being crucified and yet being Son of God. All, all was at length unraveled and made plain. They saw it all. They understood it all. Their doubts were removed. Their stumbling blocks were taken away. Now at last they possessed clear knowledge. And possessing clear knowledge felt unmingled joy. The disciples, these are the disciples who had witnessed Christ's miracles and teachings and all the things he'd done during his earthly ministry. And then they witnessed his arrest and they witnessed witnessed his death and crucifixion, and then they had that turmoil. On the third day, he rose, and they were with him as he was, he was teaching. And then he ascends to heaven, and they worship him. Their response is to worship, even as Ryle said, not to feel like they were orphans left, but they understood the Spirit had helped them to see these things, and they respond with joyful worship, this fruit of the Spirit 
this aspect of it, Christian joy, that unshakable love, delight, and pleasure that we have in our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit that drives us to worship. The joy that we have when we gather together every Lord's Day on the mornings and often in the evenings. We come together to worship and we come in, yes, with reverence and awe, but we come with hearts overflowing with thanksgiving and joy because we know who we're worshiping and we know who we are going to enjoy fellowshipping with and communing with through the means of grace. That's the joy that we have. Christ's disciples, they worship him, and then we read through the New Testament, they continue to worship him, they continue to gather. So much so that this is such an, an important aspect in redemptive history that we see the corporate gathering of God's people shift from the old covenant, Lord's Day, Sabbath, Saturday, shifting from the Saturday Sabbath to the Sunday, Lord's Day, gathering of God's people to commemorate the resurrection of Christ. When God's people, as we read in the New Testament, gather together in the New Covenant to worship Him. And Jesus, having completed His work of redemption, He returns to heaven after blessing His disciples. That's what we see here and as He departs and, and what we, we refer to as the ascension of Christ returns to heaven. You know, it's fitting that Jesus Christ, he's the divine high priest, that he ends his time with his disciples. Uh, we don't read here that uh, he, he has some small chit-chat. He doesn't say bye. He doesn't go around and hug everybody. I'll see you soon. But instead, what, what we see, it's like the ironic benediction. He lifts his hands and he gives a benediction to his people to the disciples that are there. He blesses them. That's the last thing he does before he ascends into heaven is he lifts his hands and pronounces a blessing upon these disciples. And it's a beautiful, powerful thing. It's what God's people have received throughout the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. It's how our corporate worship services end so that when you see the elder, when you see me at the end saying, now it is time, receive the Lord's blessing, his benediction, and I raise my hands, you don't think that's Pastor Blevins raising his hands to tell us something special. But instead, your immediate thought should be, God is using this elder, speaking through him. It is God, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who is giving me his benediction, his blessing. And we enjoy that until he brings us home to him in death or he returns. And then we'll live in the consummation of that blessing, that promise, that benediction forever. So we looked at the risen Christ who appeared to his disciples to give them peace, the risen Christ who appeared to his disciples to give them a mission, and the risen Christ who appeared to his disciples that he might bless them and worship them. As we remember, Jesus Christ's resurrection brings peace, calling his church to worship and mission. Let's pray. Lord, we, we praise you for the gift of your word. We thank you for corporate worship. We thank you for the reading and preaching of your word and the way in which the Spirit uses it. Such silly, foolish things in the sight of humanity, and yet it is what you use, the means of grace, to gather and, and save the loss and to sanctify and encourage and build up your saints, your people, that we might be sanctified, conformed to the image of Christ, made more and more like him. Lord, grow our love for you and our understanding of your love. Lord, as we receive the benediction in a few moments, let us not hear it from the, from the lips of your servant, but may we hear you speak that blessing upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.